Sword and Laser. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. Oh, I think something happened in the decontamination chamber. Nothing happened. Little... Everything is just fine, Veronica. You all right? I'm great. Okay, okay. okay. Well, uh, welcome to another amazing Not author under spot. Not a spell. Welcome to another amazing author spotlight, where we shine our eldritch light upon authors to espy their deepest motivations and schemes. We also ask them your questions, and, and some by us, too. Yes, I have been commanded to tell you eight things you should... Oh, what? Hi. Thank you. Uh, let's tell you eight things about Elizabeth Bear. Elizabeth Bear is from Hartford, Connecticut. Her first professionally published fiction appeared in 2003, and her first novel, Hammered, appeared in 2005. She has worked as a stable hand, a typesetter, various media jobs, and a stint at the Whole Donut. Veronica was also born in Hartford, but she's more of a Duncan fan, I think, right? That's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Elizabeth won the Campbell Award for Best New Author in 2005, Locus Award for Best First Novel in 2006, and in 2008, her short story, Tideline, won the Sturgeon Award and the Hugo Award for Best Short Story of the Year. And in 2009, she received the Hugo Award for Best Novelette for Shoggoths in Bloom. Wow. Uh, you know, she is actually one of only five writers who have gone on to win multiple Hugo Awards for fiction after winning the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writers, uh, the others being C.J. Cherry, Orson Scott Card, Spider Robinson, and Ted Chiang. Bear co-wrote A Companion to Wolves with Sarah Monette as well as the sequels The Tempering Men and An Apprentice to Elves. The two have also collaborated on several short stories. Bear also writes for and is co-executive producer of Shadow Unit at shadowunit.org. It's an experiment in creating serialized fiction optimized for the web. It's, uh, quote, a science fictional story about a group of unrealistically sexy FBI agents struggling to protect humanity from the worst monsters imaginable. That's my favorite kind of FBI agent. Yeah, I love that genre. Yeah. Her books range from a fairy war in Shakespearean England to Norse mythology in a post-apocalyptic world to Lovecraft's Shoggoths hanging out in 1930s Maine. Shoggoths. I'm Shoggoths. saying Shoggoths? Don't say it too much, they might show up. Uh-oh. Uh, she has described her science fiction novel Dust as a secretly gothic novel that includes a love story between a girl and an evil house that is really a generation ship. Elizabeth makes her own ginger beer using fresh grated ginger, lemon juice, sugar honey, and yeast. You know, beware of exploding bottles, however. Oh, good point. She also has been known to make a hot buttered rum with coconut rum and vanilla sugar, which she asked on Twitter to always be her friend. We would like that to be our friend as well. We want her to be our friend and make us drinks. Mm. Delicious. Uh, so now you know all about the drinks Elizabeth Mayer can make, but there's a lot more to her than that. Let's get a little more insight from Aaron in the whiteboard. Pity the protagonist of an Elizabeth Bear novel. Speculative fiction is, perhaps due to being a projection of human nature in extreme conditions, a dangerous place. If the zombies don't eat you, the evil wizard will melt your face, and I'm sure we could spend all day and night cataloging the ways various red shirts got phasered, squished, splattered, nuked, or drop kicked around the genre. But that type of abuse is, as a rule, reserved for mooks. Our protagonists, outside of strict horror, usually escape with some light scarring and some PTSD. Not so in Bear's works. Her protagonists are underdogs, severe underdogs, opposed by titanic forces often embodied by entire governments, or worse. The escapist comic book aesthetic would give the characters of Bear's Promethean Age or New Amsterdam series all the glamour of the rebel, but without any of the actual danger. But Bear isn't satisfied by trite daydreams. Win they might, but before they do, these characters are going to earn your empathy. They're going to bleed. It's a surprisingly rare phenomenon. Speculative fiction is a genre of consequences, in which the authors explore the results of a fantastical premise or a significant change to an otherwise realistic setting. Combined with the violence we mentioned earlier, you'd think that more protagonists would be subject to realistic risks. But how many authors have casually brought about a Lovecraftian apocalypse, without, as Bear does in Shoggoths in Bloom, really dwelling on what that would mean for those intelligent enough to see what was going on? It's left to authors like Bear to demonstrate in stories like Tideline that soldiers who go into battle can be expected to be wounded and to mourn, even if they ostensibly win. And what is the consequence of that type of somber realism for an author working in a genre which is, we are so often told, the refuge of unrealistic escapists? How about the John W. Campbell Award, two Hugos, and a locus? Respect. Things got a little dark there for a second, but it yeah. ended on a high note. Drop the trophy Respect. there at the end. Yeah. Respect. Well, you are hopefully 
prepared because it's time to bring on Ms. Bear herself. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, Elizabeth. Hi, I'm thrilled to be here. So we recently had uh, Hugh Howie on the show, and uh, he also has a book called Dust, and uh, I wanted to know if you're mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's actually kind of a funny story because Dust was the the publisher's title for that book. Um, it had a had a different title when I was working on it. Oh. Uh, Pinion, which I, I was uh, particularly fond of because it's its own antonym. Huh. Sort of. Well, interesting. Metaphorically yeah. speaking, uh -huh, pinions uh -huh. pinions are wings, and right. to pinion something is to tie it up. So. Cool. Very cool. So when a publisher does something like that, does it really throw you off your game? Or how, how do you feel when a publisher steps in and changes a title? I could not. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a trilogy. There are three books in it. All three of them had their names changed. And I, to this day, cannot remember which title goes with which book. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the only drawback is that sometimes I'll, I'll be, uh, especially when I was working on the third one, I kept calling it by the title of the second book. Oh, really? Um, which is not the best way to self-promote on the internet, but... <laughs> <laughs> Such are the they perils. didn't hire me. For, oh, sorry. Such are the perils of naming. That's Such are the perils of naming. Be careful what you name a thing. Yeah. Names have power. Names have power. And they can be confusing. <laughs> uh, you've been working a lot on the Eternal Sky series recently. Yes. For those who haven't read it yet, can you give us a little bit of an overview? Um, absolutely. It's an epic fantasy trilogy with a little bit of a, a twist. Um, it is set, it's not a historical fantasy, which some people have said it is. Um, I want to be very clear about that. It's a made up world. Uh, it's just a made up world that's inspired by the history and peoples of Central Asia rather than uh, sort of generic European medieval uh, knights and, and uh, right, squires and so forth. Damsels in distress and castles. And yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, there are, there are a certain number of, of fortresses and, and a damsel or two, but uh, not, hopefully not in the, the traditional setting. Not in the traditional. The, the tro tropes exist, but I hope I've taken them in a new direction. What are, what are some of your influences for something like that? Oh, you know, the, uh, the funny story is that I started writing that book because of a friend of mine, one of my very best friends, who happens to be of Indian descent and is a, a many times great-great-granddaughter of Genghis Khan through Chagatai Khan. And she had been bemoaning the fact that it was very hard for her to find fantasy novels that deal with her heritage. And since I write, the, I, I, the best, way, best thing I could do to fix that was to write her one. Uh, so the, the first book is dedicated to her sons, actually. That's awesome. Um, That's a really good way to fix a problem. Yeah, just be like, all right, I done. can do that. Yeah, yeah pick it up. Yeah. You, could, you can complain about it or you can do something about it. Well, and it seems like it's an expanding uh, thing. I mean, Saladin Ahmed with Thrones of mm -hmm. the, uh, Crest, Throne of the Crescent Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I feel like there's more authors saying, you know, let, let's take these fantasy stories. Like you're saying, it's still fortresses and, and people in distress, but let's not set it in medieval Europe type places all the time. Right. And uh, Howard Jones has also uh, had a series out that's, um, Arabic influenced. The uh, uh, Paul Weimer uh, refers to this as Silk Road fantasy, mm, that's um, a good which I think is a very nice, nice way of putting it. Yeah, I definitely yeah. like that. Now, as we saw in the whiteboard video just now, um, you've won a lot of really prestigious awards recently, <laughs> and I was curious to know, like, how does that affect your work? Is that what drives you, or, or what about working in this industry kind of fulfills you with your writing? The, the thing, the, the reason that I really write and write for publication is the occasional people who come up to me and say, well, first of all, because, because I have to get it out of my head or it'll just sit there and drive me crazy, but also the occasional people who email or come up to me and say something to the effect of your book helped or your book made me feel like I wasn't the only person on earth who had ever gone through something like this or your book showed me somebody else, um, who I felt I connected with. Of course, that, that means that, conversely, the absolute worst emails are the ones that are like, well, you're, I think your book showed this thing, and I think you really screwed it up. <laughs> right. And you get those, too. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the price you pay, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it, it's the interconnected world, so you're going to get more of the good, but also more of the bad. We, I, well, I hope it's more of the good. Yeah, and you hope it's always more of the good. I, I think that is 
an incredible feeling to be able to say that you helped someone across a distance. It's one thing to like sit with someone and mm -hmm. see that maybe your words are having an effect. I, you know, I think all of us at least have had that at one oh, you, time. You or another. affect me a lot. With your words. <laughs> hopefully, your words hopefully a positive me. effect oh. in, in more cases. Uh -oh. <laughs> but, but to be able to be like you weren't even trying necessarily to help that per person in particular and to have them reach out and say that that must be incredibly gratifying. It, it really is. It, it makes me feel like I'm justifying my carbon footprint, um, <laughs> which is really at the end of the day, if, if you've done that, um, you've probably done your best. Yeah. Exhale that carbon dioxide more freely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about collaboration. You collaborate with Sarah Monette, uh, but of course you yes. still write solo. What do you like about collaboration versus solo? You know, not all authors do it. What, 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 was your choice in, in being able to collaborate and why with Sarah? Well, uh, Sarah is one of my dearest friends um, and she and I have very similar literary interests. Um, we, we bonded over Renaissance theater. When, okay. uh, I was writing the Stratford man and she was working on her dissertation and it just, we, we actually started writing together as, as a lark, as, as, as our project that we were doing to procrastinate on the thing we were supposed to be doing, um, which was a, a companion to wolves and to something we totally wrote just for the fun of it. Um, Sarah is really kind of delightful to work with because I trust her as an artist and I also trust her as a friend. So what winds up happening is she goes through and, and I, I write and she goes through and edits my prose and then write something of her own. And then I go through and edit her edits and I edit her prose. And then I write something of, you know, I, I write until I get bored and then she takes over and writes until she gets bored. And it's, it's nice because you, you don't have, well, somebody still always has to write. There's, there's always going to be a bit nobody really is in love with that has to get done somehow. But it, it does mean that if there's a thing that I don't really feel, I'm not feeling the mojo for, I can see if she wants to do it. Also, she breaks up all of my hideously complicated sentences <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and vacuums out uh, extra commas. And I, I, have a, I have a comma problem. I have the reverse comma problem. Maybe you could send me some of your commas. That's true, and actually. And I can use them, yeah. That's, that's I, have, I also have a, a surplus of semicolons, if you have any use. Excellent, yeah, I could always use a good you semicolon. You could set up a trading system somewhere, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but speaking of collaboration, uh, you've been doing the SF Squeecast for a long time with a lot of other really notable authors, and you've even won a couple of Hugo Awards. Uh, my question, how do we win a Hugo Award? <laughs> is there a trick to it? Um, is there like a, something we should know? Um, Know anyone who can nominate Veronica's us? Veronica's very competitive. I'm a little bit competitive. I can nominate you. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, for, for those who don't listen, I know a lot of our listeners and viewers also listen to your show. Um, wh what's the show about for someone who hasn't heard the, it before? The, the Squeakast was, uh, it was an attempt, and I don't even, it was, it started on Twitter uh, when we were talking about the panels we'd really like to do. And somebody came up with the idea of the, the positivity panel, you know, the, the panel where you only talk about things you really love. Um, and it turned out to be a heck of a lot of fun, and we've been doing it ever since. We're actually instituting a format change this year. Oh, really? Uh, because what we've been doing is having everybody bring a thing to squee about. And uh, we, we may have gotten a little burned out on, on that. So now what we're doing is, is more open discussion of categories of things um, that we think are awesome. So what's like a recent, recent subject matter that you've covered on the show? Uh, well, the, the one that we just recorded was uh, fiction, uh, our, our, the things that we th had read in the past year, fictionally speaking, that we thought were award worthy, that mm -hmm. we wanted to direct people's attention to. And one of the other rules of the Squeakast is that we don't talk about our own stuff. And when we have a guest on, they don't, they don't talk about their own stuff. So um, we try to, try to try to bring some credibility to the table. <laughs> a, well, it makes sense. A but... sense of impartiality. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, the, the facade of impartiality. <laughs> I wasn't going to say facade. But, uh, we got some listener questions. Uh, folks uh, posted Excellent. some stuff on Goodreads. Tama Home wants to know, what do you want on your tombstone? <laughs> or what is your favorite joke? And feel free to tell it. Which are, which are two of the questions we ask people on the Squeakcast. Told you we had some listeners crossover. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I, I think, I don't know, <laughs> ideally what I want on my, my tombstone is no closing date, but I, you know, <laughs> 1971 to blank, but I don't think that's actually probably going to happen. Mm. Um, so I, I have a much, I would have a much easier time telling you what, uh, what various fictional characters should have on their tombstones. Um, because I, I, that's one of the things I figure out about my characters. Well, to share some of those then. That'd be well, great. Well, uh, Jenny, Jenny Casey's tombstone, uh, she wants it to read, you should see the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. That's a pretty good one to start with. I like that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> that, maybe that should be mine, too. Yeah, just steal that there one. That's go. perfect. Use that. Uh, Darren wants to know, um, I read The Ghostmakers in Fearsome Journeys, the new Solaris book of fantasy, uh, the first of your writing for me, and loved it. Range of Ghosts is on the docket to be then read next. Um, are we going to see any more of, of the gauge, or soon, perhaps? I'm going to, uh, I'm working on a book proposal, actually, that, uh, that uh, involves the gauge and the dead man, who are the two protagonists of uh, Ghostmakers. Um, we'll see if anything comes of it. So, what, what's the storyline there? Uh, it involves a, a long trip to a portion of the Eternal Sky King Kingdoms that we have only heard of so far and not actually seen. Ah. And uh, a, a road trip and uh, an insane cleric, basically. That sounds good. That road sounds trip exciting. stories are the best, yeah. anyway. <laughs> always, exciting stuff always happens on road trips. Uh, Three we... road trip. Gotta love it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sandy wants to know, or, or writes, I have read Hammered and All the Windrack Stars. I just started Range of Ghosts. These books are wildly different from each other. What is your favorite kind of book to write? Is there, Or is there any genre you want to write but haven't attempted yet? Oh, um, I keep, I, I have an idea for a, a para, paranormal murder mystery um, that is, is sort of kicking around the back of my head. Um, that I haven't quite had the courage to approach yet because it's going to require a lot of research. And I, my, my problem is uh, that I have a very short attention span when it comes to, to genre. I, have, I am a very Catholic reader of speculative fiction. I like almost all of it. And I grew up reading all of it. And I have a head full of stories of everything from hard science fiction to, you know, pseudo magic realism. And I probably would have been more commercially successful at this point in my career if I had just stuck to, you know, near future science fiction thrillers. Um. Well, that seems to be a running theme these days is, is authors trying to decide if they want to stay in a series with familiar characters because that seems to be more lucrative or, or do, and a lot of them are doing what you're doing, which is trying out different genres. Yeah, although I've got a lot of ideas in the, the Eternal Sky world, so I may, may be playing with that for a while if the readership is there. Yeah, especially if it's fun to play in, which is, uh, it, sounds like it's a blast. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I, I'm really enjoying the really big canvas, so. Nice. All right, well, speaking of big canvas, now it is time for our super questions. <laughs> and these uh -oh. are questions, I know they sound way scarier than they Lightning actually round. are. We probably shouldn't have called them super because that's <laughs> intimidating. Um, but these are questions that we're asking a lot of our different authors so we can kind of, you know, gauge, get some temperatures taken from, from around the globe. Uh, the first question, though, actually is pretty specific to you. And this is, uh, what public figure would you be least surprised to find out is actually a member of Shadow Unit? Ooh. Um... Well, that, that we're, we might be cheating a little bit because we kind of drafted Judy Dench without her <gasps> knowledge. Oh, she's so, <laughs> that's, yeah. As uh, around the um, around the the shadow unit water cooler, uh, Judy Dench is the the person who we would love to see playing Madeline Frost. Brilliant, love that. She can even have an ac British accent. It's fine. That's fine. You're you're, <laughs> you're cool with that. <laughs> She could be she some kind of double Connery, agent. That bastard. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, there was that newsroom character with the British accent. They're like, she's American, but she grew, you know, she went to school in Britain mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. You can always write a She went to boarding story. school oh. or something. Yeah, yeah. You, can, yeah. You, can, you can make something up. Absolutely. Uh, and the other question in the super questions is, what sci-fi or fantasy trope do you think just really needs a rest? Just, you know, put it on the shelf for Long a while, sleep. maybe, before it's revealed. <laughs> <laughs> it's talking murder mysteries. Um. Yeah. I, I have a, a little list. See, the thing is that I have this little list of tropes that I hate, and then somebody always comes along who can pull it off. And I'm like, I hate this trope, but you <laughs> do it really well. Um, I could probably 
go a, a long, long time before I read another medieval fantasy in which women apparently have no social role and there are no economics. Um, food comes from places. Cloth comes from places. And I think sometimes you can really tell that fantasies have been written by people who grew up in a house where meat and vegetables came from the grocery store in packages with plastic on them, and they've never thought about the, the source of the source of anything before that. And and this is not a new complaint because, sure. uh, you know, the the tough guide to fantasy land complains about this problem. So. It's all part of world building. I mean, it's, it's you know, yeah. we have to kind of, if you want a world to be believable, you kind of have to include those kinds of elements. Otherwise, it's just very surface. Yes, exactly. And that's that's why it really... And that and this this idea that medieval women had no role in society, um, and Other didn't than act dropping like, scarves every once in a while or something. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they were just there to be pretty and, and be rescued, and they didn't have anything to do like running households or, um, you know. Anyway, sorry. It's all. It's, all, it's not all just running around jousting. Come on. Yes, it's yes. all just running around jousting, and nobody has to feed those knights or, yeah. or shoe their horses or weave the cloth for their. Exactly. Billowing cloaks. Exactly. Perfect. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It was fantastic. Thank you. It was fun talking. And her latest novel, Shattered Pillars of the Eternal Sky series, came out March 19th of 2013. And the next in the Eternal Sky series, Steels of the Sky, comes out April 8th. And that's it, folks. If you want more Sword and Laser, there's lots. Join our Goodreads group at goodreads.com. Subscribe to the podcast, both audio and video, at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, everybody. Lem, hey Lem, can you get the lights?